Good evening and welcome to Power for Today Prophetic Ministries with George Dello. And uh, tonight on our Tuesday night Bible study, we're going to be continuing uh, in our study looking at the difference between uh, people that are religious and people that are spiritual or true Christians. And uh, as we look through the scriptures, uh, we see that Jesus made this distinction and also the scriptures make the distinction. And uh, uh, we're going to continue tonight to see exactly uh, what it is that makes the difference. Why are there uh, many in the church today uh, that are religious, uh, but not necessarily spiritual, not necessarily uh, true Christians that have been born again by the Spirit of God. So before we get into the Word tonight, let's just take a moment and let's go to the Lord and uh, ask Him to, uh, uh, to uh, open up the Word to our understanding and to uh, give us that spirit of wisdom and revelation to know Him better. Amen. Uh, praise God. Glad to have you here uh, tonight, Lisa. Hope everything's going well. Amen. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you, God, for your word that you've given us. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who you've given to us uh, to teach us and to lead us and guide us in all the truth, to open the word to our understanding and to reveal unto us uh, the truth of that word, to rightly divide it. We thank you. We have anointing from you uh, to teach us all things. And I pray, O oh God, that uh, your spirit would move upon the hearts and minds of every hearer and uh, open the word to their understanding to receive the truth that will transform their lives. And we just thank you for your word, Father. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. And we thank you, Lord, that you reveal these things to us so that we can be prepared uh, for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in that day, uh, that we will be the faithful virgins, we will be the uh, faithful uh, servants, we will be those, O oh God, that are uh, ready, watching, waiting, and uh, uh, we will be uh, received by you in that day uh, because we have come into a place uh, through the redemptive work of Christ to be prepared for you. We bless you and thank you for this word tonight in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, just a quick recap as we're going through this. Uh, again, we're looking at the difference between uh, being spiritual and being religious. What, what, what is the difference? What makes the difference? Uh, be, because Jesus tells us that in the last days church, there will be many uh, in the church that are what he considers religious, having a pharisaical spirit. And, uh, and, 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 and he tells us that, uh, you know, they say, Lord, Lord, they, they, they do things in his name. They prophesy, they do wonders in his name. Uh, but Jesus said that he doesn't know them and they're not getting into the kingdom of God. And so it's important that we understand this because, again, when Jesus says there'll be many in the church, that's, that's a little frightening. Uh, that there are a lot of people in the church who are religious, but they're not spiritual. They're not truly born again. And uh, uh, that's a dangerous place to be. And the reason that there are so many in that condition is because there is a veil of deception uh, over the church in this last day. The Bible tells us that would happen because of uh, a false gospel being preached, because of... Uh, 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 false uh, teachers and prophets in the church in these last days. And so that's what's happening. So Jesus tells us that the, the, uh, these Pharisees, these religious people, the problem is that uh, outwardly uh, they appear righteous to men. Outwardly. Again, just like he talks about in Matthew 7, you know, they know how to do the right things. They know how to say the right words. They know how to dress good, to look good to act the part, but, but that's the problem. They're acting. Jesus calls them hypocrites. He, he, he says when, when he looks at their hearts, they're full of uncleanness and lawlessness. And so uh, Paul describes these in 2 Timothy chapter 3 as those that have a form of godliness, 
but deny the power thereof. In other words, they don't. They have a form, but not the reality. Uh, the, again, it's the same as the Pharisees. They're they're hypocritical uh, because they know how to look good outside before men, but the reality is God, who searches our hearts, sees the truth, and He calls it hypocrisy, uncleanness, and lawlessness within. And so uh, that's that's the, what we're dealing with when we talk about people being in the church that are religious but not spiritual, not uh, actually uh, born-again children of God. And then as we, we looked at this, we, we uh, looked at Second Peter, uh, because again, Paul said that they had a form of godliness, but benign, denied the power. Well, Peter tells us what the power is. It's the divine power of God to give us everything we need for uh, uh, life and godliness. In other words, it's God's power to make us godly in a real and practical way. And uh, that's what we discover is the difference between being religious and being spiritual, of being a true Christian and being a, a Pharisee. It has to do with this idea uh, whereby there are many in the church today that deny the power of God to actually change us, to actually uh, uh, get the sin out of us and make us into a new creation. And that's what Paul talks about. He says this divine power of God is, 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 uh, uh, is, is, is something that's real that actually makes us godly by doing what? By delivering us from the corruption of this world, delivering us from the lust of the flesh, and making us partakers of the divine nature of God in righteousness and holiness. And so then we, we looked at uh, uh, that whole concept of a nature and uh, uh, how Jesus explains to us it's, it's our nature that determines our fruit. It's our nature that determines what we do. So if we have a good nature, we do good things. If we have a bad nature... We do bad things. And he, he relates that to trees and to, to plants. Uh, for instance, a, 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 a fig tree doesn't bear thistles. Uh, a grape tree doesn't bear bananas. Why? Because that's not their nature. And Jesus relates that to the condition of our heart. If our heart is righteous, if our heart is pure, then we're going to bear righteous fruit. But if our heart is still full of sin and impure, then we're not going to bear righteous fruit. We're going to bear fruits of sin. And so that's what he, he uh, uh, tells us through these concept of nature. And so uh, uh, I want to get into now where we left off last week. And again, what it all comes down to is the power of God. And, and this is something that uh, the, the, the church really has missed, really uh, e even multitudes of ministers and pastors just don't understand this. And, and, and what's happening is they're not preaching the full gospel, they're not preaching the true gospel, and what happens is they leave people in a condition of sin and yet declare them to be righteous, to be justified, to be holy uh, in name only. And that's not the gospel. That's Old Testament. That, that, that's Old Covenant. They, they couldn't have holiness. They couldn't have true righteousness, true justification, because they didn't have the means to actually make them holy. That's why Jesus came. Jesus came uh, in order to make this a reality. And uh, so last week we left off talking about the difference between the justification of Abraham, the justification under the old covenant. Okay, Abraham believed God and was counted to, to, to him for righteousness. Okay, that's justification. But here's the problem: the justification, the righteousness of Abraham, couldn't save him. It couldn't. It couldn't bring him into the promise. And uh, you can go over to Hebrews uh, chapter eleven, the faith chapter. And he tells us that none, of, nobody, none of them, Abraham, David, Moses, I don't care who it was, even though they lived the life of faith and all pleasing to God, that justification could not get them the promise. And the promise is the Holy Spirit 
uh, coming inside of us to impart eternal life. They couldn't receive the promise. Why? Because their justification was based on a faith under the law, uh, 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 under the old, uh, the old, under the Old Testament that could not deal with the issue of sin within the heart. So when we look at the justification in the New Testament, the justification in the New Testament is still by faith, but it's rooted in the blood of Jesus Christ, and that's the difference. Okay, and so when we look at that justification that Paul presents to us, especially in the book of Romans, uh, we find that uh, uh, it's a justification of life, and uh, it, it, it means the presentation of, a, of ourselves to God as living sacrifices, that we are not conformed to this world anymore, that we've been spiritually renewed, and uh, uh, everything that God does is in a real and practical way. In other words, a justification that is, does, that is not accompanied with a change of character is not New Testament justification. And that's not what the Bible teaches, okay? Because, again, it's based on the blood of Jesus Christ. So when we look at the Scriptures talking about what happens when God does the things that He has prophesied and the things that the New Testament speaks about, Christ does in order to bring about our redemption, our salvation. Uh, we find that uh, uh, in every case, uh, these passages that talk about the various things that God comes to do in order to make us into a new creation are always accompanied uh, with terms, with words, with, with uh, 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 the, within these passages, uh, with things that tell us that the result of what God did is real. In other words, it produces a change. And, 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 and what is behind that is that the redemptive work of God requires the power of God. It is not God just making a declaration and, and, and basically waving his hands and declaring that you're saved, that you're holy, that you're a new creation, and basically lying. When, when God declares us uh, under this new covenant to be holy, to be born again, it's because we are, be, because it takes God's power to do it. It takes God's power to actually bring us into uh, that redemptive work. And so that's what I want us to look at tonight. As Paul told us in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, after listing all, all these sins and, and telling the church, telling the church, rebuking the church because there were some in the church in Corinth that were uh, getting off into sin and that were even, even sinning against one another. And so Paul told them, he says, if you're, if you're living in this sin, you're not going to get into the kingdom of God. And, and then Paul said this, and such were some of you. Were, once were, not anymore. We were, we all were sinners. But Paul says because of the power of God, because of what God did, we once were, but we're not anymore. Why? Because we've been washed. We've been sanctified. We've been justified. In the name of Jesus, and he didn't stop there, here's what he said, and by the Spirit of God. In other words, it is not just a declaration of God, which isn't true in reality. It, 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 it is a work of God by the power of his Holy Spirit to actually wash us, to actually sanctify us, and to actually justify us in a real and practical way whereby we become new creations that walk in newness of life and bear the fruits of a good tree, the fruits of a new nature, uh, because God has literally changed us into a new creation. So let's look at this because, again, all of this is borne out by the Scriptures which re reveal the results of God's power to actually change our hearts and thereby change our works. Because again, uh, uh, anytime you change the nature, you change the fruit. Okay, 
The only time you're going to bear bad fruit is if you have a bad nature. That's, that's what Jesus was explaining with the trees. But if you have a good nature, if you have a nature of righteousness and holiness, your fruit is going to be righteous and holy. That's what he's talking about. So last week, and this one I want to pick up, last week we began to look at these. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6. And this is a prophetic scripture talking about what, what uh, 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 Jesus was going to do through the, through the work of Christ. And he says, and the Lord your God, and we have to remember the context of these prophetic scriptures in the Old Testament that talk about the new covenant, that talk about the coming of Christ and God's redemptive work under, under the new covenant and, and this, this, this work that Christ would come to do. When you look at the context of all these prophetic scriptures, you will find that the context that these are given in was the fact that Israel was continually sinning against God. Israel, uh, even though they were God's people, even though God was like a father to them, even though God was like a husband to them, even though God was, was there among them in manifest ways, uh, even though all the things that God did for Israel, they were still disobedient, unfaithful, and idolatrous. And so whenever you see these, these prophetic scriptures about what God was going to do, it's always in the context of God declaring to us that he was going to do something so that he would have a people that weren't like Israel, that he would have a people that were not idolatrous, that were not disobedient, and that were not unfaithful in a real and practical way that we can truly be God's people and he could be our God. And, and that's what it's all about. So in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6, he tells us, And the Lord your God will do what? Will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants. Okay? Well, we know that's what he did. Uh, Colossians tells us that's exactly what Jesus came to do. But look what he says. When God circumcises your heart, and, and it includes our, the descendants. I mean, this is for everybody. This, this is necessary for every single child of God. They had physical circumcision. They didn't have anything to circumcise their hearts. Okay? So he says, and the Lord your God will circumcise your heart. God's doing it. It's not something we do. God does it. And what is the result? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, that you may live. That, that's that's the, the, the great commandment. Jesus tells us the greatest commandment is that we love God with all our heart, soul, and strength. Well, you can't do that uh, as long as you have a heart of sin. As long as you have a sin nature, you cannot possibly love God with all your heart, soul, and strength. That's the problem with Israel. That's why God promised a new covenant. That's why God prophesied he was going to do something new because they couldn't love him with all their heart, soul, and strength. Why? Because a heart of sin is rooted in pride. And the very essence of pride is to worship and serve ourselves. In other words, as long as we have a nature of sin, our nature is one that is focused on self. Uh, John, in 1 John, tells us what, what that nature is all about. It's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's what's in you until Jesus does his work. So, so God says, I'm going to do something. I'm going to circumcise your heart. I'm going to cut off. I'm going to cut out. I'm going to remove that, that, that sin nature. I'm going to remove that heart of sin. I'm going to remove that heart of pride and lust. Why? So that you will be able to love God with all your heart, soul, and strength. In other words, what he is saying is when God does something, he does it in a real and practical way, and the result is that you're changed, and you now love God. That's what the Holy Spirit does when he redeems us. He comes in, and by the power of God and the blood of Jesus Christ, he comes in and he circumcises the heart and washes us in the blood of the Lamb. And in doing so, he gives us a brand new heart and a new spirit and a new nature. And what does he do when he, when he cleans house? He then comes into us. And what's he do when he comes into us? 
he pours the love of God, the agape love of God into our hearts. <laughs> Romans chapter 5. The love of God is poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he gives us. And what is the result? We love God with our heart, soul, and strength in a real and practical way because we have a new heart and a new nature. Our desire is changed. Our focus is changed. We no longer live for ourselves. We, we no longer live in lust and flesh. We no longer seek to worship ourselves and, 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 and to, to live after ourselves. Why? Because we have a new heart and a new nature, and that heart and that nature is one after God. This is why I'm saying when, when we look at the church and Jesus tells us that, that, that the last day church is going to be full, full of religious people because they don't, uh, they've never come into the reality of God's power to make them into a new creation. And so that's what we're seeing in the church today. That's why when we look at the church as a whole, now don't get me wrong, there's always a remnant. God has a remnant people that have, that have uh, uh, come into the full work of Christ. And you know them. You see them. You'll know them by their fruits. They live a life of righteousness and holiness. They, they live a life unto God. They're sold out. They're on fire. They're, they're doing the things of God. They, they live a life unto God. But look how many people in the church, there's no fruit. And, and you don't see that reality. Why? Be, because they don't believe in the power of God. They have a form of godliness, but deny the power of God to actually produce this work in us. So, so let's look at these because, again, this is borne out by the Word of God itself. We don't have to guess about it. We don't have to, well, you know, which... which no, it's, it's borne out by the Word, okay? So look what he says. So the, the circumcision of God should result, if God has circumcised your heart... It's going to result because, again, God can't lie. And when God does something, when God in Ezekiel, God says, Ezekiel 36, says, I will make you clean. And guess what? He says, you will be clean. When, when I do this thing, it will do exactly what I commanded it to do. Why? Because what God does, it's done. It's finished. And, and the result is going to be seen. The fruit is going to come forth. So the result is our ability to love God with all our heart, soul, and strength. And what does it mean to love God with all your heart, soul, and strength? To obey His commandments. This is love for God, to obey His commandments. Now remember what Jesus said in, in Matthew 7. Many will say in that day, Lord, Lord. Many are going to say, Lord, Lord, and even be doing it. He says, we work miracles in your name. We, we prophesied in your name. We did this wonders works in your name. What did Jesus say? you're not doing the will of my Father. You're lawless. In other words, they're not obeying the commandments of Christ. They have a form, but they, they lack the reality. They lack the, 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 the fruit of a changed life. So Jesus says, you can say, Lord, Lord, all you want, but if you're not doing the will of my Father, you're not getting into, my kingdom, into the kingdom of God because I don't even know you. You're not one of my children. You, you see what he's saying? This, this is what he's talking about. And, and, and so uh, when God does something, the fruit is going to be manifested because he tells us either make the tree good or make it bad, one or the other. You can't have both. There, there is no middle ground in all this. Either you're a good tree or you're a bad tree. And a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. It's impossible. Why? Because your fruit is determined by your nature. And when God gives you a new nature, a new heart, a new spirit, everything, everything, everything is new in a real and practical way. So let's look at this. John chapter 8, verse 34. Look what Jesus said. Jesus answered them. He says, Most assuredly I say to you. Now, you have to listen to what the Word says because, again, if we would just read the Bible with open eyes, with open hearts, with open minds, and allow the Holy Spirit to teach us, everybody would be, be doing and walking and being exactly what God called us to be because you can't read the Word of God in, in, with open eyes and, and not see uh, what God is telling us that everything about the new covenant, everything about Jesus Christ coming is all about one thing. 
It's the power of God to make us a new creation. Now look what he says. I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. Okay? Listen to what Jesus said. If you commit sin, that word commit means you practice sin. You, you have areas of sin in your life. He says you're a slave of sin. Why does he say you're a slave of sin? Because the reason that you sin, the reason that we have so many people in the church today living in fornication, living in, in adultery, living in, in lives of, of uh, abuse, living in, with anger, living with lust, living with, you can go on and on and on, is because they're enslaved to sin. In, in other words, whoever controls you is what's going to be manifested in your life. The reason that people are living in sin in the church, claim, claiming to be Christians, is because they're enslaved to sin. Jesus says, if you commit sin, you are a slave of sin. That's your master. And, and who's behind that? Well, that's Satan. Okay, The prince of the power of the air works in the sons of disobedience, those who are led by the lust of their flesh. You're, you're under his, his headship if you're living a life of sin in the church. And, and uh, that, that's what Jesus said. Now, look what Jesus said, okay? If you commit sin, you're a slave of sin. Romans chapter 7, verse 19, look what Paul said. For the good that I will to do. Now, you have to understand this. Paul's talking about his uh, a pre-salvation condition, okay? Just going, just, you, can, you can get this just by what Jesus just said. Look what Paul says. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. In other words, Paul's saying, and again, you have to remember, Paul's talking from his experience as being a Pharisee of Pharisees. I mean, he was educated. He followed the law to a T, just the way the Pharisees and the scribes did that Jesus rebuked. That, that was his rebuke. They followed the law to the T outwardly, outwardly. The problem wasn't out. The problem was inwardly. That's why they looked righteous outwardly, but inwardly they were full of sin and hypocrisy and uncleanness. Okay? So Paul says, I want to do good, but I can't do it. I don't have the ability to do good. Remember, a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Okay? So he says, but the evil I will not to do, the evil I don't want to do, okay? he says, that I practice. Now watch what Paul says. Now, if I do, now, if I do what I will not to do, if I'm doing what I don't want to do, he says, it is no longer I who do it. It's not me that's doing it. He says, but sin that dwells in me. Sin that dwells in me. What's Paul saying? Whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. What makes you a slave of sin? It's the indwelling of sin. The presence of sin makes you the slave of sin. In other words, whatever's in your heart is what's going to come out. What did Jesus say about sin? Where is sin? It's in your heart. Out of the heart comes what? Murder, adultery, lying, you name it. It comes where? Out of the heart. So if your heart, which is your nature, is a heart of sin, a nature of sin, what's going to come out? sin. You can't do what you want to do. So in Romans chapter 8, look what Paul says, verse 7, because the carnal mind, okay, the carnal mind is enmity against God. It's that enmity. It's that enmity with God. It's the enemy of God. It's not the friend of God. It's not for God. It's against God. It's against God. That's why the Bible tells us in Romans 3, nobody seeks God. None of us is righteous. And before you were saying, nobody's righteous. Nobody seeks God. Why? Because it's not in you. You're at enmity with God. You don't have anything to do with God. Look what's happening in America today. Why do you think all these voices out there keep coming against God, keep coming against the church? Why? Because they're carnal-minded and they're at enmity with God. It's a, it's a spiritual battle. It's Satan against God. And where's Satan operating? In the sons of disobedience and those that are walking in the lust of their flesh. So what's he say? 
for it is not subject to the law of God. Sinful flesh is not subject to the law of God. That's the problem. Who's it subject to? Satan. It's subject to Satan. That's what Jesus said. Whoever commits sin is a slave of sin under the power of Satan. So you're not subject to the law. You don't obey God's law. Nor indeed can be. It can't be subject to God. Why? It's at enmity with God. It's at odds with God. So what does Paul say? So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. He's, talking about, he's not talking about your body. Your physical body is neutral. It's not sinful. It's not righteous. It's just neutral. What determines whether your body is sinful or righteous depends on what you use it for. What's controlling it? Okay, He's talking about, when he uses that word flesh, it's sarks. He's talking about sinful flesh. So Paul says, those who are in the flesh, those who are walking after the sinful nature, cannot please God. It's impossible. You can't do it. You can't do it. That's why, again, go back to Romans 7. What did Jesus say? Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And what did they say? That's what we've been doing. We've been prophesying. We've been working miracles. We've been doing wonders. And what did Jesus say? I don't know you, you workers of lawlessness. It's not what you do. It's where you your motivation for what you do. It's where it's coming from. It's where the source is. That's what he's talking about. You can do good things, religious things. You can give everything you have and sell it and give it to the poor and still go to hell. Why? Because good works won't get you into heaven. There's only one thing that's going to get you into heaven. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 13. He says, even if you give everything you have to the poor, if you don't have love, it's in vain. You just wasted your time. There's no reward. And the only way to have it in love, the only way to have a heart of love is what? The Lord God will circumcise your heart in order that what? You can love God with all your heart, soul, and strength. In other words, everything you do comes out of a heart of love. That's what he's talking about. That's what he's trying to explain to us. That's what Jesus was talking about. Listen to this. When Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, did you see what Jesus said? And he tells us in the Word, Jesus tells us this. If your righteousness does not exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not get in to the kingdom of God, okay? And he tells us, and their righteousness, they, I mean, they tied their mint, and their, I mean, they, they follow these little laws. Anything outside, anything out here, they would do the thing. They would look righteous, okay? But what did Jesus say? What was the problem? What, what, was, what did Jesus explain that the problem was? Why why they were hypocrites, why they were religious, even though they were doing good works, okay? What did he say? If you have lust in your heart, it's the same as being an adulterer. If you have anger in your heart, it's the same as being a murderer. Do you see what Jesus is saying? You don't actually have to commit the sin to be a sinner. If it's in your heart, what you do is tainted. It's defiled by the condition of your heart. Like Paul says, you can't please God. Why? Because the motivation and the things that you're doing are coming out of a wrong heart. And God is the one that does what? He searches the hearts and minds of his people. He's going to judge the thoughts and attitudes of your heart. Now think about this. If, and, and, and remember what Jesus said, if, if you have lust in your heart, you're going to hell. 
Okay, he said that. And just go go read the, the Sermon on the Mount. You're going to hell. That's called hypocrisy. Okay. Now now think about this. How many people in the church today live in sin? I, I mean, whatever whatever kind of sin, live in sin. And think that they're going to heaven. Okay. They think they're good to go because they said the prayer. They have this ungodly belief that no matter what they do, it doesn't matter because when God looks at them, he just sees the blood of Jesus. That's one of the biggest lies from the pit of hell. God's, God sees everything you do. Go ask Ananias and Sapphira if God didn't see their sin. Go, 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 go ask them if, if God couldn't see their sin because of the, the blood of Jesus and what happened to them. You, you see the, 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 the deception that's in the church? But, but here's the point I'm trying to make. If Jesus said, if you have sin in your heart and aren't actually committing the sin, you're going to hell, how in the world can people in the church think that they can actually commit the sin and not go to hell? Do, do, do you see the lie? Do, do you see the deception of what's going on in the body of Christ today exactly as it was prophesied? Jesus said the last days that the, the church will be full of lawlessness. Paul said that the last days church would be it'd be a dangerous place to be. Why? Because it'd be full of the love of money and 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 and, and self-seeking and unholiness and disobedience and and, and love for pleasure. It, it shouldn't surprise us, but we need to know the truth. And get set free. Okay? Now look what Paul says. So, so he's telling us, he says, there was a point in time before he got saved that he was carnal. He was, he was of the flesh. And he discovered that even if he wanted to do good, he couldn't do good. Why? Because his heart was bad. His heart was bad. And, and he couldn't please God. No matter what he did, he could try. He kept failing and failing, just like Israel. Just like Israel. Okay? Why? Because his heart wasn't circumcised. So Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 5, verse 17, he says, here's the problem. If, if you're in the flesh, says, the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. Okay. Now, now don't misread this. You've got to read the whole passage. You can't have flesh and spirit together. It doesn't work. Okay. You, you, the, the, if you keep reading down in Romans chapter 8, he'll tell you, if you have the Holy Spirit, you're not in the flesh. You can't have the Holy Spirit and be in the flesh. You can read Second Peter chapter 2. You can read the book of Jude. He'll tell you. If you're living under the lust of the flesh, you don't have the Holy Spirit. It's impossible. It don't work that way. Read what the Word says, not what somebody tells you. Read what the Word of God says, okay? I don't have time for that right now. But look what he says. And these are contrary to one another. They're of different things. <laughs> One's at enmity with God, and one is in total agreement with God. Okay, They, they don't coexist. You, you'd be living a life of war your entire lifetime if that was possible. They don't coexist. And look, if, if it was true, if they could, listen, look, look what Paul says. They're contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. You don't do the things you wish. You see what he's saying? Why? Because he who commits sin is a slave of sin. You do what the sin wants you to do. You don't do what pleases God. Like Paul says, the flesh cannot please God. God didn't come to give us power over sin. Jesus didn't die to help you control sin. That's not why he died. Jesus came and died upon that cross to do what? Take away your sin. He removes the source of sin. He removes the heart of sin so you don't have to control sin. You just live a life of faith walking in the Holy Spirit. It's not about controlling sin. He cuts off the sin, okay? The bottom line is this. As long as there is sin present in your heart, okay, 
you are being ruled by the lust of the flesh and do not obey God. And that's a bad place to be. You can't love God with all your heart, soul, and strength when you've got pride in your heart. You can't love others as we should, as we love ourselves, if you have lust in your heart. You can't serve God the way we're supposed to with all our heart, soul, and strength. If, you're, if you have a heart of selfishness, it can't happen. Everything in that heart of sin is contrary to God. Everything is anti-God. Everything is pro-self, selfishness, pride, lust. That, that's why we got so much pornography in the church. And these, these, these programs don't help. Why? Because that's not the key. That, that, that's not what sets you free. Okay, this is why we're talking about it. You've got to get set free from that stuff. Okay, we Again, and what is the result? You end up having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. You deny the reality because you deny the power of God to make you godly in a real and practical way. But again, the redemptive work of Christ, when it is brought about by the power of God, it results in true godliness. Ezekiel eleven nineteen. Look what look what he says. Ezekiel eleven nineteen is another one of those prophetic verses talking about Christ. Then I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within them, and take the stony heart out of their flesh. Did you hear what he said? I will take the stony heart, the heart, the heart that is envy with God, the heart that is against God. It's, it's not sensitive to the touch of God. It's not repentant. Okay? He says, I'll take the heart, the stony heart, out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh, a heart sensitive to the touch of God. And look what he says. That they may. In other words, when I do that, when I remove the stony heart and give you a new heart of flesh, here's what's going to happen that they may walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. What's he saying? When God does it, he does it in a real and practical way by the power of his Holy Spirit to cut off that stony heart of flesh, and what is the result? You will obey God. It's going to happen. Why? Because you have a new heart of obedience. Not because you're controlling sin, but because you don't have a heart of sin anymore. He took it out of your flesh and gave you a brand new heart, a heart after God. So in Ezekiel 36, verse 25, what did he say? I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. If God says something will happen, it's going to happen. You can take it to the bank. God cannot lie. If God says, I'm going to wash you, and you're going to be clean, you will be clean, guess what? If God washed you, you are clean. Not, not covered over with some filthy rag. Not covered over. No, clean. Whiter than snow. Washed, pure, holy. If God makes you clean, are you going to tell me that you're not clean? That he cannot remove every spot, every blemish of sin in you? That Jesus died for nothing? That Jesus went to the cross and failed to fulfill his mission to do what? To save us from sin? To take away the sin of the world? That he failed? That his blood is no better than the blood of bulls and goats which could not remove sin? Is that what we're saying? Because that's what a lot of people in the church are saying. That's what they believe. God says, I'm going to give you, uh, 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 I'm going to sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean. He says, I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I'm going to take it all away. Now look what he says. I'm going to cleanse you from your filthiness, from your idols. 
pride, selfishness. I'm, I will cleanse you. Is God a liar? Is God not able to cleanse our hearts from sin, from filthiness, from idolatry? That's what we're saying if we continue to live in sin. And what does he say? I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you. Everything's I, I God, God, God saying. God said, I will, I will, I will, I will. I'm doing it. It's by faith. I'm doing it. God's saying, I'm doing this. I'm washing you. I'm cleansing you. I'm circumcising you. I'm removing a stony heart. I'm putting a new heart. I'm putting a new spirit. And then he says, I will put my spirit within you. And what's the result? What is the result? What is the evidence that God has actually done this work in you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them? The result is obedience. You will know them by their fruits. You will know who is a real Christian. You will know who has the Spirit of God. You will know who has been born again. Why? Because they will obey God. They will walk in his statutes. They will keep his judgments. They will do what God has commanded us to do. If you're not doing what Jesus said to do, guess what? Something's wrong. You've denied the power. Either that or God's a liar. Colossians chapter 2, what did he say? Verse 11, in him, in Jesus Christ, you were circumcised. Now watch this. You were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. In other words, he's saying we're not talking about an outward circumcision. We are not talking about a circumcision of the flesh, of the, of the, of the, the physical flesh. We are not talking about a circumcision of, uh, 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 of just a declaration. We are not talking about a circumcision done by you. Okay? Okay? He says, the circumcision is being done by God. Okay? He's the one. He's the one. Christ is the one that does it. Now look what he says. By putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. When Christ circumcises you, what's he do? He fulfills Ezekiel chapter 11. He fulfills Ezekiel chapter 36. He puts off. He puts off. He removes. He cuts away. He circumcises. He cuts off what? The, the body of the sins of the flesh. <laughs> He's not talking about your physical body. If he cut off your physical body, you'd be dead. Come on. You'd be dead. He cuts off the stony heart of sin. He cuts it off. He puts off the, the, the body of the sins of the flesh. Okay? Buried with him in baptism. He's not talking about water baptism. He's talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is how this all comes about. The Holy Spirit is the executor of God's will. He's the one that carries out this redemptive work, okay, in us. He's the one that washes us in the blood of a lamb. He's the one that, that actually circumcises, cut off the heart, okay? And what does he say? Buried with him in baptism, in which also you were raised with him, with Christ, through faith. Now watch this. Through faith in what? The working of God. The working of God. Again, it's not a declaration. It's the power of God that does this work. In other words, in other words, let, 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 me, just, let me just give you a real simple, just, just simple, foolish, simple example. Okay? If God said, let, let's say all of us were, were, were our, our, our skin was yellow, okay? 
All of us are yellow. And God says, well, uh, if you have yellow skin, you're not one of my children. And, and uh, that yellow represents your, your separation from me. God says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going I'm to save you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a work that uh, is going to change you and make you a child of God. And when I save you, when, when I do this work in you, you're going to turn blue. Okay? Your skin's going to turn blue. And, and, and when, when you turn blue, you'll know that you're a child of God, okay? The, the blue color is not what saves you. It's God changing you from yellow to blue, okay? Now, watch this. If, 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 if that was what salvation was, God says, when I save you, you'll be changed from yellow to blue. That'll be the evidence that you're saved. So, so, so God tells us what to do to get saved. So we, we repent and we, we, you know, believe God. And uh, God declares us forgiven. God declares us justified. God declares us sanctified and holy. God declares us that we're, we're, we're saved. Okay? But when I look at you, you're still yellow. But, but you're saying, well, when God looks at me, I'm blue. But you're still yellow. Well, why aren't you blue? Because reality is, all God did was, uh, as far as you're concerned, now I'm not saying this is what God does, because this is the lie here. As far as you're concerned, God did it because you, 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 you went through the motions, you said the prayer, and you believe that in the eyes of God, you're blue, even though everyone sees you, you're yellow. See, that's the lie, that's the fallacy. That didn't take any power. That didn't take God having to actually come down and do anything in a real way inside of you. That's just declaring you're, you're blue when the reality is you're really yellow. And that makes God a liar. Okay, And that's what the church doesn't seem to understand. That's why when every one of these scriptures that we look at, the evidence is because is that something changed. So, so what does he tell us? That uh, uh, what brought about the change? Because what he does, the circumcision, the washing, the cleansing, is done by what? By your faith in the working of God. That God actually had to come down and work inside of you by the Holy Spirit. Again, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of Jesus, but by the Spirit of God. It wasn't just a declaration. It was God literally coming down inside of you, going inside of you, going right into your heart, going right in there and cutting out, circumcising, cutting off that body of the sin of the flesh and removing it from you and taking that blood and applying it to your body, soul, and spirit, washing you completely, washing in the blood of Jesus Christ. He actually takes the blood and washes you in that blood. Okay? And, 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 and so he says, what is the result? What is the result? You who were dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your heart, he has made alive together with him. Something had to happen to get you from death to life. He made you alive. Well, as long as there's sin in you, you're dead in sin. As long as your heart's not actually circumcised, you're dead in the uncircumcision of your heart. In other words, if God's power didn't actually come and remove the sin, the death of sin, and remove the uncircumcision of your heart, you're still dead. You can only be alive. The source of death has been removed, and the source of death is sin. That's the only way you can become alive. That word energy, the working of God, that Greek word is uh, energes. It, 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 it's a word we get energy from. It means efficiency. It's an operation. It's a strong, effectual working. It is the strong, effectual working of God. Effectual means it produces something. It actually produces. Something is not effectual if it doesn't produce the desired result. And, and see, that's what's happening in the church. We're saying that the blood of Jesus Christ is not effectual. It's not able to actually produce 
a deliverance from sin, and a new righteous nature. That's what we're saying. But Paul's telling us in Colossians that exactly what God prophesied in Ezekiel 11 and Ezekiel 36, Jesus actually accomplished through the working, through the very energy, the power of God, the, the, the strong, effectual working of God to actually produce this deliverance from sin, this circumcision of the heart to make us alive in a real and practical way as new creations in Christ Jesus. Effectual means successful in producing a desired or intended result. It's effective. It did exactly what God meant it to do. That's the gospel. That's the truth that sets you free. The redemption of God comes through his effectual working, resulting in our being set free from the death of sin and having our hearts circumcised in order to make us a new heart, a new spirit, free from sin, and then fill with the Spirit of God so that we can walk in newness of life. We live a new life. Why? Because we're a new creation and we have a new nature. We're a good tree. We're the trees of righteousness. Doing what? Bearing fruits of righteousness. Bearing fruits of righteousness. That's what we looked at last week from 2 Peter uh, uh, chapter uh, 1, verse 2 to 4. Let me just read it again. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord as His divine power. God's divine power. God's power. God's divine power. His dunamis. His dynamite power. His, his, his uh, uh, all-powerful power. His, his power that can do anything He wants it to do. The same power that raised up Christ from the dead. His divine power has given to us, whoever will believe, all things for life and godliness, eternal life and godliness. You can't have one without the other. How? Through the knowledge of Christ, who called us by glory and virtue. Through the knowledge of Christ. Remember what he said. Then you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Here's the truth. It's in, the, it's in the knowledge of Christ. It's in who Christ is and what he did. By the, through the knowledge of Christ, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. I, I mean, better promises than anything under the old covenant. Better promises than, than anybody in this world can ever give you. Exceedingly great and precious promises from the mouth of God. Right from the mouth of God. What were those promises? What, what, what promises is he talking about? What did he say? I will take the stony heart out of your flesh that you may walk and give you a new heart of flesh that you may walk in my statutes and make and do my judgment. I will cleanse you from your filthiness, from all your idols. I'll give you a new heart, a new spirit. I will take the stony heart out of your flesh, give you a heart of flesh. I will put your, my spirit in you, and you will do what I said do. That's God's promise. Right from the mouth of God. And what did Peter say? Through these promises, you may be a partaker of the divine nature of God, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. That's the promise of God. So either God is a, prom is a, is a liar, or we're deceived. There's a whole lot of deceived people in the church. Because the promise of God says... When God does it, it's done. When God says, I'll make you clean, you are clean, whiter than snow, not a spot or a blemish, holy, without blame before God, a glorious church, a holy bride, no spot. Why? Because the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin, all your filthiness, all your idolatry washed away in the blood of the Lamb. So Paul tells the same exact thing in Romans chapter 6, verse 6. I'm going, to, I'm going to close this up. I, 
I, I could preach. Listen, this this is not to brag, or, but I get so excited when I see what God has done for us. I could sit here and preach for until the, the sun comes up. And that's no lie. I've done it before. <laughs> because this is so, so revolutionary. This is so uh, uh, revelation. This is so important. This is so key. When you understand what God did for us, and, and, and you take a hold of these promises by faith, and, 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 and re let God's power be released in you, to, to, to actually raise you up into the newness of life, you'll understand what I'm talking about. You'll understand why I get excited. You'll understand why I can preach this old, and, 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 and all night long. You'll understand what I'm talking about because God does it by his power. Look what Paul says, knowing this. What did Jesus say? Then you'll know the truth. You'll know the truth. You'll know the truth, and the truth will what? Set you free. And whom the Son sets free is what? Free indeed, completely, totally, forever in the name of Jesus. What's Paul say? Knowing this, here's the truth you need to know. Here's the truth you need to know. That our old man, our old man of sin, our old man of Adam, our old man of sinful flesh is crucified with Christ. What is the result? What is the result again if there's no change of character, there was no crucifixion. What's he say? That, that the body of sin might be destroyed. That the body of sin might be destroyed, not your physical body. Come on now. Come on. That it would be destroyed, circumcised, cut off, put off, put away, removed. Okay? Okay? And what did he say? That henceforth. What's Paul saying? That from the time that Jesus circumcises your heart, that the time, from the time that you, uh, old man, is crucified, put to death with Christ, okay? You have to understand, he's just using different terms when he talks about this old man of sin, this heart of sin, whether he uses the word circumcision, he uses the word crucifixion, he's talking about the same work. Okay, Sometimes he's talking to Jews, sometimes he's talking to, to Gentiles, to Romans. So he uses different language, but he's saying the same thing, and the result is the same as you see. Now look what Paul says. When you know, when you know, when you know, Revelation, when you know that your old man was crucified with Jesus Christ, the body of sin was destroyed. Henceforth, here's what he said, we do not serve sin. Henceforth, we do not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. He who is dead is freed from sin. What did Jesus say? He who commits sin is a slave of sin. But whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Meaning what? You no longer serve sin. You serve God. You serve righteousness. You serve Christ. If it's not happening, Go back to the Word. Go back to the cross. Go back and get the revelation until you know that your old man was crucified with Christ and you are no longer a slave of sin. And if you're not a slave of sin, you shouldn't be committing sin. It's that simple. That's why I'm saying, I don't care what scripture you want to look at, what passage you want to look at that talks about the redemptive work of Christ, it always it is in, in the context that God actually did this work by his mighty power, by the blood of a lamb, by the Holy Spirit. And the result is a change of nature and character. You no longer live. You no longer act that way anymore. Why? Because you have been set free. You have been set free. 
Now, if you look up that word, uh, uh, destroy, the body of sin, destroy, if you look up the Greek, it means to render entirely idle or useless. It means to abolish, to cease, to deliver, to destroy, to do away with, okay? To become of none effect, to vanish away, to make void, to, to put to naught, to put down, okay? That's, that, that, that's what it is. Now, let me ask you something. Does this sound like a, a mere declaration of God that would declare us to be righteous but still leave us in a condition of sin? Does that what all these scriptures say to you? That, 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 that God says, when I save you, you're going to be blue and not yellow, that you're still yellow? Does that what these scriptures sound like? It all speaks of a work of God's power. And the result is real. We no longer serve sin. We, we no longer live a life of sin. We've been set free from the power of sin. You see, our problem is, the question we ask is, how can we not sin? That's what we ask. How can we not sin? That's what Christians say. That's what people preach. How can we not sin? We'll be sinning from now to ever. You know what Paul's question was? How can you sin? If you're dead to sin. How can you possibly sin if you died to sin? That's Paul's question. That's the question the church ought to be answering. That's the question you need to answer for yourself. How can you sin? How can you continue to live a life of sin if you die to sin? And what did Paul tell them in Romans? The only way you can do that is because you don't understand what Jesus did upon that cross. You don't know the truth that sets you free. Well, listen. It, it, I, I, have to, I have to keep these at least, you know, time-wise, because I'm, I, if, you, if you've been listening to me for, for more than a week, you know the way I minister. Word upon word upon word upon word. I'm not telling you what I think. I'm not telling you what I have to say. I'm telling you what the Word of God says. That's why I use Scripture upon Scripture upon Scripture upon Scripture. Why? Because God's Word will always agree with itself. And the power is in the Word and the Spirit. I'm just telling you what God said. Okay? I believe it. And I receive it. And I've seen what it does. Okay? I know what it does. I've experienced what it does. I've had my, 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 uh, I, I've had my divine encounter with, with God's power. I know what it can do. I know it delivered me from alcohol and drugs and, and lust and, and, and filth. I know what it does. Okay? But that's the reason why I give you the word. Because it's the truth that's going to set you free. And so I try to not to go too long on these because you need to go back and, and watch these videos. You need to go back and write down these scriptures. You need to go back and ask the Holy Spirit to open the word to your understanding. Just, just pray the word of God to him. Just say, Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, give me the spirit of wisdom and revelation to know you better Open the eyes of my understanding so I can know the hope to which you have called me. I can know the, 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 the glorious riches of Christ Jesus. I can know the, the, the exceeding greatness of your power toward us. I can know it, and, and because I know it, and when it becomes flesh, when that word becomes revelation in my heart, when it, when it releases faith in my heart, I take hold of the promise, and I am set free. I am set free. Like Paul says, I don't serve sin anymore. Why? That's not who I am. I'm blue. I'm not yellow. I'm blue now. <laughs> and everybody that sees me sees I'm blue. God sees me. I'm blue. And he's not, he's not faking it. You see what I'm saying? So I want to encourage you 
if, if you haven't had this experience, if you haven't come in to a place that you know that you know that you know you're a new creation, you just don't have a heart for sin anymore, you don't like to look at it, you don't like to entertain yourself with it on the TV, on the internet, you don't want to watch it, you have a hatred for sin. You, you, when, when, you, when you mess up, when you slip, when you do something, when you do, you, there's something, come on, the Holy Ghost come upon you, this, the conviction of God, He chastens those whom He loves. You know. You, and you're like, God, forgive me. I mean, you know, you're not you not going to meditate on it. You're not going to dwell it. No, God, forgive me. I, I, I messed up. I sinned. Forgive me. Wash me. Get it, get it away from me. Get this filth off of me. Like the psalmist says, I, uh, I don't even look upon sin. I don't set any sin before my eyes. You see? If, if, if you don't know, you don't have a heart after God. You just want to serve Him. You, you want to worship Him. You want to do what God's called you. You want to be a witness. You, you're on fire for God. That's the evidence that you're born again. When we look at people in the church today that, that never, ever witness to anybody, that never tell anybody about Jesus, that are ashamed of, their, uh, uh, of talking about Jesus, that, that, that uh, you know, don't don't even I mean worship time and is is like if you don't have a heart after God, it's because you haven't experienced the power of God yet. When those people in the New Testament got saved, they died for Christ. I mean, you go read some of the history books. I'm talking about going back in the first century. Read the history. First, first eyewitness accounts of what the church went through. I, I'm talking about unimaginable tortures and deaths. Like, you, you, you just can't even imagine. They make ISIS look bad. And yet those people faced those tortures and deaths with a smile on their face and Jesus on their lips. They counted it a privilege to be a martyr for Jesus Christ. Why? Because they were new creations that had enough, no attachment to this world, no attachment to this life, no longer live for themselves. They live for the one who died for them. Their lives, their hearts were so full of the love of Christ, they refused to, to, to deny him. They refused to, to just, just, all they wanted them to do, say, just say Caesar is Lord. That's all they had to do. They, 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 they refused. It says, I refuse to worship anybody but Jesus Christ. You can do whatever you want to do to this body. I don't care. You're just sending me home. We have no clue. The Church of America, we have no clue. We should all go live in China for a while or North Korea and see what it's like to be a Christian and see if we'll stand the test, see if we will hold to our faith and, 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 and if we really have Christ in us to the point that no matter what they do we're, we're gonna we're gonna praise God we're, we're gonna hold on to him right 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 out of this body and, and into heaven and when you have all these people in the church today that uh, have never truly experienced the power of God it's lip service. It's lip service. They honor him with their lips, but their hearts are far from him. You think when persecution comes in this nation that you're going to stand? When they come into the churches and begin to shut the churches down and begin to tell you, you denied Christ or we're going to send you into a re-education camp, you think you're going to stand when you can't even Stand in church and worship God with all your heart, soul, and strength when you can't tell others about Jesus Christ while things are good? You think that you're going to stand fast and not deny Christ? Ain't going to happen. Ain't going to happen. If he doesn't have your heart, you're going to find yourself falling. And that's what Paul says. Second Thessalonians, be a great falling away. Why? Because they're not rooted and grounded in the faith. They're not continuing in the things of God. They're not living a life unto God in obedience to Him. 
because they've never experienced the power of God to make them into a real new creation where everything old is gone and you now live for God and Him alone. You love Him with all your heart, soul, and strength. And you love your neighbor like yourself. Just take that one passage of scripture, Matthew 22. Get in the closet. Put away your phone. Put away everything. Get in the closet. Lock yourself in for a couple hours. And just ask God to show you what it means to love him with all your heart, soul, and strength. And love your neighbor like yourself. And I guarantee you, if you're real, you'll come out changed when you understand what that means. When you understand what that means, you will come out a changed being. And that's what he's called us to be and to do. And again, you don't love God with all your heart, soul, and strength if, if you don't even obey him, if you're not willing to do what he said do, if, if, if he's not preeminent in your life, if you don't live for him, if you don't serve him with all your heart, if you don't be a witness, if you don't uh, have a, live a life of prayer, and live a life of worship, and live a life of of the Word of God, if, if you don't have a heart for the things of God and His kingdom, it's because you've never had a divine encounter with the power of God. And, and, and the answer is, go get it. Get on your knees, get on your face, and cry out to God until He comes and does exactly what He said He would do. Circumcise that stony heart give you a new heart, give you a new spirit, wash you clean, body, soul, and spirit, put his spirit in you, pour the love of Christ into you, make you a new creation to walk in newness of life. That's the answer. So, so share this video. People need to hear the truth because a whole lot of people in the church are going to end up in hell because they've never heard the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Share this video. Tell others about it. Be back next Tuesday. Next Tuesday is the uh, third Tuesday, so it'll be 735 next Tuesday night. I'll be here to continue and hopefully finish up this part of the message because God's given me some other words I need to get out to the church to deal with some issues going on in the church, to deal with things that are happening. I need to get the word out. So I want to try to finish this one next week. Tell somebody. Get people on here. Share this video. Be on Facebook. Be on YouTube. And all of them are on there. Go back and watch part one, part two, part three, so you can understand what I'm talking about. And again, write down the scriptures. Be like the Bereans. Paul was, Paul was pleased with the Bereans. Why? They didn't just take what Paul said. He told them, check it out for yourself. See, we, that's one of our problems. We think because somebody has a title or somebody has a, a position, that, 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 that whatever they say, you know, we just, okay, okay. No, check it out for yourself. Check it out. Why do you think there's so much false doctrine in the body of Christ? Because people with titles and positions are telling people lies. They're called false prophets, false teachers, false brethren. They're in the church. You check it out for yourself. You can't stand before Jesus and say, oh, so-and-so said. No, no, you check it out for yourself. Don't take me for what I say. Check it out. That's why I give you the scripture. Read the scripture. I'm not telling you what I think. I'm reading the word of God. Read it for yourself. And the Holy Spirit, you have an anointing. If you, if you truly know God, you have an anointing that will teach you. He's called the Holy Spirit. He's called the Spirit of Truth. He will rightly divide the word of God and give you the revelation to embrace the truth that will set you free. If you seek God, that's what you'll get. Because God will come to those who earnestly seek him. You just got to come with a heart of faith and a heart of repentance, a heart of humility. You know, I had to do that. I thought I knew everything. I had to do it. God, I don't know anything. Teach me. Because I'm, I'm looking at the word saying one thing and I'm hearing all these people telling me something else. And I know somebody's wrong. And, and I was wrong. I had to repent of what I believed because I believed a lot of this foolishness. I repented of it. God, teach me the truth. You teach me. God cut me off. He put, us, put away all. No, no more books, no radio, no tape. No, cut everything off and had me get alone with him and the Spirit of God and the Bible. That was it for years. Just me and this Bible, in this Word. Day after day, reading the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation, the entire Bible, every three months, 
reading the entire Bible. In fact, in the beginning, I was reading it every, uh, uh, every uh, uh, month. I was reading the entire Bible through. Every month, reading the entire Bible through. Because God was trying to show me how that word is the same from Genesis 1-1 all the way to Revelation 22. It is the same word, the same God, the same message, the same redemption all the way through. And when you understand the whole counsel of God, when you begin to see the picture come together from beginning to end, you begin to understand what I'm talking about. This whole gospel is about one thing, the power of God to make you holy, to make you holy in a real and practical way. So I encourage you in that. I'm just going to say a quick prayer, and I'm going to get going here, let you go. In the name of Jesus, Father God, I pray that you open every blinded eye, break through the darkness of understanding, break through the lies and deceptions of the enemy. Lord God, those that have come, and un come under that veil of deception through false teaching, they have uh, rejected the truth and believed a lie. I pray for the mercy of God to be upon them, that you will break through that darkness and reveal the truth, Lord, that you will convict them, that you will move upon their hearts and minds and allow them to see the error of their ways and that they will begin to seek you, Lord. Put a divine compulsion in the hearts of your people to seek you like never before until they get the revelation, until they get a hold of the truth that will set them free. Lord, you said that you're not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. I pray, O oh God, that you will move upon those hearts, those foolish virgins, those, those disobedient uh, 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 servants, those, those goats. Uh, uh, in the in the church, Lord God, those tares among the wheat, Lord, those that, that, that say, Lord, Lord, but have never been truly born again. God, I pray that you will save those souls, that you will break through and bring them into the reality of this gospel in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, this is George Dello, Power for Today Prophetic Ministries, coming to you from Toronto, Ohio, where it is snowing again. <laughs> I'm mad at Phil. I'm, I'm mad at that 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 uh, Phil Pawtuxie Phil said that spring was coming early. Uh, he, I, I don't trust him anymore. It's been snowing ever since he said that. It's been snowing here in Ohio almost every day since he declared that spring was coming. It's been snowing here, and and so I'm just I'm fed up with that guy. He better go back in his hole and get things straight. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. I'm, so, I'm good, glad to see all of you on here, friends, in, in uh, oh, geez, Arizona, uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, Jamaica. Uh, praise God. Good to see you all on here. Uh, I appreciate you uh, being with me. I, I really hope that you share these th this word. Uh, we need to be telling people this word, whether or not they watch this video. They, you need to be telling them the, telling them the truth uh, be, because their blood's on our hands. If, if we don't warn uh, the people, the blood's on our hands if we don't warn them and we know the truth. And, and, and so we need to be doing that. And I encourage all of you to do that. Don't just, don't just be a hearer, be a doer. Go, go, to, go tell somebody what you learned. And, uh, uh, and, and, and if they need more, say, well, here's the video. Go listen to the video and, 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 and uh, listen to the word and, and uh, uh, let, 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 let uh, God show you the truth. Amen. Amen. Oklahoma, praise God. I mean, uh, I appreciate all you. I love you all. And uh, uh, Lisa, let me know uh, uh, how, how Gary's doing. I, I see you on here all the time. Uh, how's he doing? And, and uh, it's been a long time uh, uh, since I've seen him. So uh, let, let me know how, how, how things are going with that. Amen. And uh, 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 Colleen, I'm, uh, maybe one day we'll get back down your way and uh, see what God does. Uh, if it's his will, uh, we'll be on our way. Praise God. Uh, give our greetings to all of our uh, friends down there and uh, tell them we love them, appreciate them, and uh, uh, send it forth the word to them. Amen. So God bless you. Uh, see you next Tuesday, 735, and uh, we'll finish this word up, and then God's got some good stuff coming down the pipe. Amen. Because I'm, I'm looking for truth, and he's got a lot of it. So God bless you, appreciate you, and see you next time. Amen.